John Ari here with AinItCool.com talking today with Michael Boogaloo Shrimp Chambers. Michael, thanks so much for taking the time. I really appreciate oh, it's, it. It's been my pleasure. Uh, so, first of all, you're sort of known as a pioneer of hip hop, bringing hip hop dance to the mainstream. How'd you get started? Well, I got started watching uh, claymation characters, some of Ray Harryhausen's work, you know, Clash of the Titans, Jason and the Argonauts, and and uh, trying to Im imitate animatronics and claymation. And um, in the 70s, they had the robot, but uh, the progression of that was actually trying to imitate claymation and, and uh, those those characters that Ray Harryhausen made so famous. And people were saying, you got to do something with this. And I met a group of people, uh, of dancers. Uh, the first person that actually uh, hit me to the actual business side, as opposed to just dancing on the streets or at the clubs, was uh, Shabadoo. Shabadoo, Adolfo Quinones, and the group The Lockers. He was already in show business, and he said, you know what, don't give it away for free, make them pay for it. So I got the agent thing, and I was, I was green, and I started doing music videos at the beginning of MTV. And uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but I was that little kid who was featured in Lana Ritchie's video all night long. And Shaka Khan's I Feel For You and the Gap Band's Party Train. So then once I started working, things just started snowballing from there. And so how did you land the gig uh, in Breakin? They had an audition. I had already been on a world tour with Lana Ritchie and working with Michael Jackson. And my name had got out there and we had a group, Shabadoo and I, we had a group called the Shabadoo Crew where we had generations of different dancers. So when the call, the script came out, I recall, you know, there were several people who went up for the role and I just had the chemistry. Me and uh, Shabadoo, Adolfo Quinones, we had this kind of hip hop Jerry Lewis thing going. You know, where I was the sidekick and, you know, and he was the suave debonair guy. And uh, we were able to deliver lines. And uh, usually when they're doing new cutting edge films like that, although we weren't actors, a lot of the stuff was off page. So it was left up to imp us to improvise. So it was just the chemistry gelled when we were going in auditions and the rest was history. So I, I got to ask you, I'm sure you get this all the time. Tell me about the broom dance. How was that choreographed? How much was that, was that you and how much of that was directors and other choreographers? <laughs> it was a lot of me. But what was really interesting, I, during the rehearsals of Breaking, I was only 16. So during the break, I was goofing around balancing the broom on my finger and the choreographer and the director happened to be watching me balancing the broom on my finger and the choreographer happened to be Hyman Rogers. Hyman Rogers was one of the original cast members of West Side Story. Now that, how much better can you get with that? So he, he said, to, he said, you know what, instead of making this choreograph, let's let, let's film, let's film this kid in his element and I'll stage it. Let's position him here. So he did the positioning, but he just like put the music on and just let me do my thing, and he 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 staged it. So that's why it came out to be a theatrical piece, you know, and and it stood the test of time because there weren't really a lot of street dancers or break dancers doing theatrical pieces. And the thing is, with his insight, he made it cool. And I, I see a lot of that in Jack Jabberwockies and a lot of the uh, uh, So You Think You Can Dance or America's Got Talent. Now dancers are putting together little mini theatrical pieces, you know, so I, I like feeling that I was a part of that or I had a little something to do with that. <laughs> so uh, a little bit later then, it seemed like you turned into the go to guy for uh, robot characters like you were you were the good Bill robot right yes, yeah. and uh, you were the good you were the robot Urkel yeah so uh, tell me like as far as how do you <laughs> how do you make a robot character different than another robot character well it's really interesting that you've done your homework and you know about that because what I perceived what I was setting out to do I was trying to as 
as I saw the years changing, I spent time in Japan, the land of robotics. And I was away from Los Angeles in the United States. And when I came back, I said, you know what? I don't want to just be that kid in a music video dancing in somebody's music video or dancing on the street or in the circle. I was, I was trying to open up doors for the industry to look at other dancers and employ them as special effects cre uh, creatures. So I told my agent, I go, I, I, I'd like to try to get to do uh, special effects and reach the attention of like George Lucas and uh, Steven Spielberg. And she went, okay, well, let's, let's, let's see what comes through. So then I got the role of Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. And they put me in a suit. And in, it, when I went in the audition, the special effects people were trying ways of cutting the budget, trying to find ways of cutting production costs. And uh, when I walked in there, you know, I, I came very, very animated. And they went, wow, that's the guy. And they could tell. They put me in a suit. They would save money in post production. You know, with the, they saved a lot of money doing that. And that's how you know I, I approached it at like an acting part, where I became the character. But because of me studying like Clash of the Titans and the the way that the skeletons move and you know the the monsters that I see, I was imitating claymation. So when they put me in character, I came to life and producers ate it up. When I went in for the audition for Family Matters, it was actually a pitch to Lorimar Studios. This special effects guy was Kenny Myers, who did the movie Sleepy Hollow and Alien Nation, all those cool monsters. Kenny Myers is a genius. He calls me and he says, you need to help me pitch this to Lorimar. And we walked in the audition and, you know, that was a pretty big fish. They were like, you know what, we're going to try to sell a robotic Steve Urkel. They're like, hmm, a robotic Steve Urkel. So the first thing I had to do was I had to watch Family Matters. And I had to get his voice down. Mm -hmm. Did I do that? And his, his, his rhythm. And then I had to interpret that as an actor to do and and mix it to do my thing and make it robotic. The glory of it was at the time of my research, Terminator 2 had come out where they had that real cool morphing Terminator. So I was already thinking animatronics and liquid animation, as I call it. So when I went into the audition, the director was Rich Carell. Rich Carell, he went, okay, he said, give me Give me King Kong 1930 on the entire Empire State Building. So I was like, Ur. Ur. I started doing these things. He's give me Medusa. He's like, wow. He, he, I was like a toy. They, all they needed was a remote control to so make him go, right? So that's how those, those parts came about. And my whole perception was... Uh, I wanted to open up doors because there were a lot of street dance kids coming out and people after me, and I wanted them to actually have a home in the business that, you know, I mean, those cool characters from Star Wars and Battlestar Galactica and people in suits, that's what made it different. My robot was an actual technique instead of somebody being in the suit. It was a technique of liquid animation. So let's fast forward to now. You're working on a James Brown biopic. Yes, yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Now, what's really interesting about James Brown, I feel like I've been preparing for this role all my life because uh, one of my former students, my, my Mr. Jackson, I mean, he was inspired by James Brown. The music and the whole, uh, just the whole excitement of it. You know, I, I grew up in a musical kind of, facet in the business and yet people never knew that about me you know I was actually behind the scenes of Lionel Richie and and all these great people so to be able to attack a character like that I was really honored that the director Xavier Ramirez from Higher Intentions Studios chose me to to, to portray the role because uh, he knew that I had the uh, I, I had certain elements that I could bring that only somebody with a dance background, with my background, could actually, you know, convey through the part. So that, that's how it came about. So how do you prepare to be James Brown on camera? Um, you know what? I did extensive research on 
certain key points that made him, you know, and they weren't the same cliche points that comedians make fun of, you know. I didn't want to, uh, you know, as him being a role model and a and a and a and, and a, a figure in the music business, so many people have looked up to him, and he was a trendsetter, you know. Despite his personal problems and things that were going off. Off, off, happening in his life off stage, you know. I really wanted to bring to light just him as a as a human being. So I started just researching interviews and anything that I could find on him that wasn't so popular, you know. As opposed to oh, the tragedies, you know. Everybody can pick that, but I I found little things that helped me with my character and. Uh, of course, you know, I being, my name is Boogaloo Shrimp. James Brown wrote a song called Do the Boogaloo. So, you know, I kind of like really started getting into my historical kind of roots, you know, and, and going going back to the bayou, as, as so to speak. And uh, like I said, I really hope that the, that the critics and people can see that research, you know, come to light when they see, when they view this piece. Mm-hmm.